that faithful are you and everyone who has trusted in you. None of them have suffered loss. Thank you for today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Good morning. Um, for those of you um, on Facebook, good morning. For those of you on Mixler and others who may be listening to us hereafter, we want to thank God for you. Um, it's a beautiful Sunday. Across the world today, a great event is being celebrated, and that is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the most powerful, the most singular, history-shattering, life-changing event that ever existed on this planet. Many things have taken place on the planet that history records. Um, the rise of Hitler, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, perhaps in different religions, different things. People have different things to talk about as great events. But for us as God's people, as believers, we know that aside the coming into the earth of Jesus Christ, the single greatest event also is the resurrection. And that is being celebrated everywhere in the world today. We thank God for the blood of Jesus, the blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Um, the mystery of the blood is a deep thing. Without the blood of Jesus, you and I um, will not even be able to make it after we have given our lives to Jesus. You know, because the Holy Spirit indwells us, and through the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that we are joined to the body of Christ. In the book of Romans, the Holy Spirit says there that if a man does not have the Spirit of God, he is not his. So, we are joined to um, the mystical, universal body of Christ by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When a man gives his life to Christ, he is instantly and immediately regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Now, what that simply means is that the seal of God is placed on him as a testament of who his new owner is, to whom he has become a slave to. Paul talks about being a slave to sin, a slave to righteousness, a slave to God. And the world is under the sway of the wicked one, largely people living in the world as slaves of sin and the devil. All right? But this morning, I want to emphasize um, in my discourse and reasoning with you from God's Word, the most important aspect in our day-to-day -day work as God's people. Yes, we're celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and that singular um, act has given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. The Bible tells us that we, he has given to us all that pertains to life and godliness. And how has he given it to us? He has given it to us through his divine promises. That through these promises, you and I are able to walk as God will walk on the face of the earth. The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. If Jesus walked the face of the earth the second time, which he is walking, and he is walking the earth through you and me, through his church, if he had to do it again, if he had to incarnate again today and walk, what are those things that you think would limit him? What are those things that you think is limiting you today that you think that if Jesus um, walked on the face of the earth, those things would limit Jesus? Um, what can you think about? Financial insufficiency, lack, poverty, sickness. Um, what can you think about? There is nothing that you think of as a limitation that is at work in your life or in the life of anyone around you that would have had a grip on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ if Jesus was incarnate today and he had to walk the face of the earth. All right? Now, does it mean that I don't have my own limitations or I'm not experiencing limitations? It's important for you to know that the Word of God tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 um, from uh, verse 19, it speaks about the love of God that passes knowledge, that we may be able to know the love of God that passes knowledge. What that means is that there is the realm of knowledge, which is where many believers exist, but there are few people who have moved past knowledge into experience. And because they have experienced what they know or what they have as knowledge, what happens is that the simple scripture that says that the word became flesh, that scripture is fulfilled in them. So they are able to live and walk daily in the power of the Holy Spirit. And their conversations are conversations with grace and power that is able to cut through straight to the heart of those that listen to them. That simply means that these men have at some point in time come into knowledge, but now they have gone beyond the gates of knowledge into experiencing what they know to be true of God. 
And this is the plan of God for us. This is God's desire for us. God wants us to go through knowledge. Go through the gates of knowledge and come into the experience of the knowledge that has been revealed to us. That is when the word becomes flesh. That is when it is in that second dimension that, that you and I can uh, manifest the divine nature on the face of the earth. Now understand this. Divine health, um, the grace to walk responsibly in wisdom and intelligence and be preserved by the influence of the Holy Spirit is called divine health. Divine health simply means that you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit and that influence preserves you, that influence keeps you. Um, you are not in and out of the hospital. It does not mean that you can't be, but you are not. You are not for two reasons. Number one, you recognize that the Holy Spirit indwells you and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is part of God's strategy to ensure that your body is immune and your life is lived out on the face of the earth for the fulfillment and the accomplishment of His plan and purpose. So you need to get that. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8 tells us, it says that if the Spirit that raised Christ up from the dead be in you, He, that is God the Father, who raised Christ up through His Spirit, will through his spirit give life to your mortal body all right now notice there that that scripture does not present the regeneration and the quickening of the believer's body as a prayer or as a condition it presents it as part of the duties and responsibilities and privileges of salvation now the holy spirit by default instinctively whether the believer is conscious of it or not, the Holy Spirit is working within the members, the physical member of the believer, to regenerate that believer so that the believer is, is able to walk in health and in strength. Now, what does this mean? It simply means that God is aware that because we possess this fallen body and we interact with this dimension or with this earth realm where the devil is constantly at work and doing different things to ensure that his cause is victory against God, God knows that at some point in time, there will be things that will pull on our health and pull us down. <coughs> like the flu, like the coronavirus, like SARS, like Ebola, <laughs> alright? And so the Lord has gone ahead of time to make that provision by the angel of the Holy Spirit. Now understand, though the Holy Spirit indwells us, we still have responsibility as God's people to be responsible and intelligent in how we engage life not to go out of our way to tempt God. Now there are instances where a child of God in the course of ministry and the witness of Christ is emboldened by the Holy Spirit to take what naturally appears to be out of sync with wisdom. I'm not talking about that. When um, John Gillick in South Africa um, in, in the early 19s was bearing witness to Jesus uh, and to the power, the, the miraculous power of God about healing, when he was, you know, speaking to those doctors, he was not trying to be stupid. He was bearing witness to Jesus. Now, don't forget, the Bible tells us that witnessing Jesus is not something we can do without the influence of the Holy Spirit. Again, you see, I'm not just talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I am talking about the influence of the Holy Spirit, which is an event that the resurrection of Jesus secured for you and I. All right. So, I want to get. I want you to see here. The Scripture tells us that. Um, when the Holy Spirit indwells us and it fully dwells richly on the inside of us, He will lead us into all truth. He will lead us into all truth. He will supply the dynamics of God. The pattern of God is at work in us. The dynamics of God will work towards us and in us, through us, to change things around us. So when John Gillick was speaking um, in, in the 1970s and he was talking to the doctors, what was he simply doing? He wasn't trying to be stupid, he wasn't asking Kelle. He had been on the mountain for many days, he was praying, he was fasting, he was waiting upon the Lord, he was um, carrying the secret place, being endued with power from on high. So when he testified to the doctors that sickness cannot kill Jesus, and that they should get him a sample of the virus, and they put a sample of the virus on his hand, and the virus died as it touched his hand, that was simply testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are two ways the Word of God tells us we should and we have to testify to Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Jesus, evangelism without miracles, signs and wonders, is a mockery to the Gospel. You may not work miracles, you may not do signs and wonders. It does not imply that signs and wonders went with the Apostles. Signs and wonders are still happening today. So you need to understand that. That, that was a demonstration and then the preaching. These are two folds of 
um, an effective witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. An effective witness should demonstrate the power of God, all right, and it should preach the gospel. It should communicate the gospel. Now, listen, I want you to know that the preaching of the gospel is not an ordinary thing. For you to preach the gospel effectively, there has to be um, the, the working of the Holy Spirit with the, within your spirit, your mind. There has to be knowledge, but there's still, you still have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak through to the people that are listening to you. All right, so that is on one side. You need the power of the Holy Spirit for that. You need the power of the Holy Spirit for working in good signs and wonders. These two together are essential for the preaching of the gospel and for the witnessing to a fallen world. So what is the emphasis? What do I want to call our attention to today as we thank God for this Resurrection Sunday? As we thank God for um, the gift of the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name that sickness is, sickness in, in that name sickness bow, in that name death give up those that are in its grief, in that name great loses power. What are we supposed to do? Why did Jesus die? Did Jesus die for us to just celebrate a market day every year, every year? No. When Jesus dies, the death of Jesus is to afford you and I an opportunity to become a member of the family of God. All right? Beyond being a member of the family of God, the death of Jesus is an opportunity given to us in Christ Jesus to become co-laborers and partners with the Lord Jesus Christ in the redemption of mankind on the face of the earth. That is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate objective of the death of Jesus. But men who are sinners will become saints and saints will become amish. Now let me say this to you. Across the length and breadth of the earth, God is using people today. The Holy Spirit moves in mighty power through different servants of God all over the ages. Some are more visible, or some were more visible, and some are more visible than others. Some are low profile. The Bible tells us that the body is a many membered body. Some parts of the body are more visible, but the scripture says that the Lord has placed more honor on the parts that are not as visible. You don't see your kidney, but if your kidney packs up, you are gone. You don't see your liver. But if the liver packs up your corn, like every, like the rule of life, the most important part in life is not the part that is seen, it's the part that is unseen. The engine in a car is what drives the car. The true value of a car is not in the beauty or in the aesthetics in the body, it is in the hidden part of that car that nobody sees, and in that part it is usually very, very hot. Because every other thing in life that is visible to sight, a link on the effective operation of the past that cannot be seen. This is very important. So, what am I talking about? Where am I going? What, is, what, is, what has been impressed upon my heart to speak to you about? What is impressed upon my heart to speak to you about is Jesus. Alright? But, but how is Jesus walking on the face of the earth today? He's walking through the person of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you about this Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that we are not here just to mark time. If anything, I want you to know that time is going. Every day that you are lying, the time is ticking. Days are becoming, minutes are becoming hours, hours are becoming days, days are becoming weeks, weeks are becoming months and months are becoming years. And before you know your time is up, and whether you have regrets or you're excited, you have to leave this planet and stand before a loving God to receive reward for what you did in the flesh, whether it was good or bad. Now, so you are saved. You are born again. What are you doing? What is next? What is next is the call of God for you. What God has called you to do. What did God appoint you to? What did God separate you to? Paul said when he was in his mother's womb, the Lord separated him to be an apostle among the Gentiles. Even within the apostolic office and apostolic ministry, all apostles are not called to do the same thing. All apostles are not the same. All apostles do not carry the same flavor. Paul recognized that Peter was an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter was an apostle to the Jews. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. So you can't even have believers who look alike, who talk alike, who ask alike, who, who walk in similar office or occupy similar prophetic office and yet they are vastly different from one another as the heaven is from the earth. So after the resurrection, what happens? The next major event after Jesus rose from the grave was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
But before we go to the outline of the Holy Spirit, I want you to see that even Jesus could not fulfill his ministry of going to the cross and dying without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit appears to be like the back room. It appears to be the, the underlying factor. It appears to be the energy. It not appear to ease the life of God, the power of God, driving the activity of God on the face of the earth. And this was true even when Jesus was here. When Jesus was here, the Bible tells us that when he came to Jordan, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And what happens? Do we want to start from the inception of his birth? When the angel, the, the angel Gabriel came to um, that wonderful woman called Mary, he said the power of the highest will come upon you, the power of the um, highest will overshadow you, and the child you will carry will be called the child of the highest. Now this refers for ministry, for those of us that have been called to ministry, a, um, uh, when I mean ministry now, I'm talking about church-based work or pulpit-based work. And as a matter of fact, the truth is, every child of God, he says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the power of God overshadows you, the child you, you conceive, and that child will be called the child of the highest. So there is nothing a child of God brings forth today as ministry that is that you can label a child of God without the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus could not be conceived by a holy person without the Holy Spirit. A holy believer is not going to be as effective on the face of the earth without the Holy Spirit. To the degree to which we respond to him and we yield to him, it is to that degree that you and I are going to be able to make profit with God and in God's kingdom, the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is conceived, Jesus is given back to, obviously the Holy Spirit was working um, in his life and he was diligent also. But at the age of 30, Jesus comes to um, Jordan. And at Jordan, the Bible tells us that there was a man in Jordan, and this man that is in Jordan, had been baptized by the same Holy Spirit when he was in the womb, when the voice of the mother of Jesus connected with the ears of his own mother, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? He couldn't even be a forerunner of Christ without the Holy Spirit. And I want to say to you that this is the forerunner generation. Not just are we living in the last days, we are living in the end time, and we are the forerunner generation. And if there's anything that characterizes the foreigner generation, the generation that exists before Jesus comes, it is the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the might in the spirit man to stand and raise the standard of truth and the standard of righteousness for a teeming billion of populations that are in the valley of decision and many are perishing on daily basis. The Holy Spirit. And so, when Jesus came out to Jordan, to be baptized by John, the Bible tells us that the Holy, the, the, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. Like a dove. It's not a dove. It's like a dove. It's describing the personality of the Holy Spirit as a gentle one. Now, Jesus goes into the Jordan. He comes out. And the scripture says that the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. The truth is this. The power that manifests after resurrection cannot be or during resurrection cannot be separated from the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit is the power of God that raised Jesus up from the dead. It's the same Holy Spirit. And it is by the same Holy Spirit that the name of Jesus bears the ultimate power in heaven, on earth, and in hell. By the same Holy Spirit. It is by the same Holy Spirit that the apostles were able to get up, the prophets were able to get up and go into various nations. Missionaries were able to do the things that will advance the cause of the kingdom, the same Holy Spirit. But when you look around us today, many people are excited about Jesus, giving glory to Jesus, giving praise to Jesus, but are not daily led in their lives by the Holy Spirit. Understand, when we shut the door on the Holy Spirit, we shut the door on every precious thing that exists in heaven that is funded on the account of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Apart from the privilege of salvation, if after salvation we do not cultivate to work with the Holy Spirit, we shut the door on Him, and it does not lead us, we are home and most miserable, we, are the most, we should declare bankruptcy in the Spirit, and in the earth, because truly, um, in, 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 in the final analysis of our work and our contribution to the advancement of God's kingdom, we are worth very little. Not in creation, but in value to advance in the kingdom, the Holy Spirit. Now, in the book of Mark, you will find out also 
that the scripture tells us on Luke chapter 4, the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 4 that after Jesus had gone to the um, wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the scripture tells us in verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit of the Holy Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. Again, you see the Holy Spirit. The news of Jesus' name did not begin to spread until he had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the one at work that made the ministry of Jesus effective and that made that news, the ministry of Jesus' news, to spread the same Holy Spirit. And I want to say to you that this third member of the Trinity is a very precious, precious, precious person. He's tender at heart, he's very, very sensitive, he's loving, and one of the things the scripture shows us about him is the only creature created by God that, uh, no, sorry, the dog, rather, the dog is the only creature created by God that does not have bile. The Holy Spirit is not a created being, he is the Spirit of God. Alright? So, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit does not retain bitterness. Listen, looking into God's Word, we will find out that God has placed everything within the Word of God to show us everything that is possible, that is needful, that is needed to make our pursuit of our calling and our fulfillment of our calling a possibility has already been given to us. Many years ago, um, while I was still back home, I was about the age of 21, and I started having dryness in my spirit. I said for some days, I, I, the Lord wasn't, I wasn't hearing anything um, from the Lord. Um, I'm gifted in dreams and visions. Uh, I wasn't seeing visions, and I wasn't having any divine communication. So I became worried, and I decided to go down to the, redeem, um, to the redemption camp, um, you know. So I took my, I, I took a few things and I felt that I was going to spend like three days um, or seven days at the redemption camp. So I bought a bus, got down to the camp. I rented um, a student's bed. And immediately I got in there, I dropped my bag and I laid on the bed and I slept off. And I slept so deep. Just as I was sleeping off, I saw a vision. In the vision I saw, myself and a few number of people who could not have been more than seven people. And uh, there was the Spirit of God in a vessel, a human vessel in our midst. And that vessel, that man said to me and to those people, he said, now than ever before, you need the Holy Spirit. And the vision lifted. And I woke up. And the Lord said to me that that was what he, that was what he brought me to the country here. That was what that was the message he had for me. I could pick up my bag and go. I didn't spend five minutes in that camp. The Holy Spirit is the most important person to us today. We may fall, we may falter, we will make mistakes, men will leave us. At some point we may have to leave certain men, but we cannot walk without the Holy Spirit. Uh, profiting on the face of the earth is, the, is to the degree to which we are responsible and responsive to him. He's the one that leads us out of the pit. Don't forget, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. So the Bible tells us um, a few um, things that you and I should know. The roles that the Holy Spirit plays in the life of a child of God. The first thing the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit is the one that fills you and raises you up as a member of the family of God. You cannot be joint heir with Christ Jesus except you are regenerated. You cannot be regenerated except the Holy Spirit has done the work in your spirit and has given you a new spirit. Now, the second thing I needed to see is that you do not have the power to do what God has called you to do without the Holy Spirit. You do not have it. When we are regenerated, we have our will. With our will, we make choices. But the regenerated child of God has his will only to do one thing. He has his will only to choose the will of God. Alright? Now, so understand that when we choose the will of God, the Holy Spirit holds us by our hands and it begins to lead us. It begins to lead us. And oftentimes they're not he will lead you beyond the places where your senses can take you. He will sometimes lead you to places that your senses don't even want to go. Alright? 
the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the things that are secret things because this is part of his duty. When Jesus was going, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. But when I go, I will pray the Father and he will send you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who will lead you into all truth. Now, what does this mean? There is all truth. There is part truth. There is no truth. And I want you to know that part truth is no truth. But there is all truth. If we engage the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. In every area of our lives, in every area of our finances, business-wise, in some instances, the Holy Spirit would even speak to us through other people. If he is unable to reach us, he wants to call your attention to something. There are different infrastructures within the kingdom of God that have been placed there by God that the Holy Spirit walks through once he is unable to reach the believer through the inward business. Alright? So the Holy Spirit does that for us. He communicates with us. He comes to us. He talks to us. I remember, and I, I also want to use the opportunity to see that those uh, singles who are listening to me, uh, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me this morning that um, I should have some teachings on singles on purpose. Now, I'm not just talking about your marital life. I'm talking about everything. The fact that if you don't find purpose as a single, um, or you mismanage your purpose, your journey as a young man, as a young woman, in your teenage years, in your 20s, in your 30s, um, you could have a lot of difficulty along the line as you relate to the call of God upon your life. That does not mean you can't fulfill it, but it's better if you start early. So, maybe from tomorrow, dedicate about an hour to that. Sometimes we'll uh, probably make the announcement after this broadcast. And just go through a few teachings uh, along those lines. Now, um, a very good example of my own journey where the Holy Spirit came to me even when I was much younger and there are many, 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 many instances. I also want to say to you that we suffer the most when we don't listen to Him. We suffer the deepest when we don't listen to Him. When we permit ourselves to become emboldened against the, His revelation, His guidance and His instruction, we are going to suffer pain, we are going to suffer wound. I have suffered pain. I have made mistakes from not paying serious attention to some of these instructions that he has given to me. I have had tremendous blessings and unbelievable benefits from having him lead me and having him, you know, guide me. But let me take a story from when I was younger. As a young man, when I was in my secondary school, as I pressed into the Lord, the Lord spoke to me about the school where he had ordained for me to go to the high institution. And at that time he said to me, I was going to the University of Lagos. And you know, I started, you know, preparing, I had written the exams and, you know, failed the exams a couple of times. As long as I say this to you, I failed the exams lots of times. Alright? Uh, and after a while, my mother came to me and said to me, I should, I should please consider going to Polytechnic. Because I loved her, I took the Polytechnic exam. I wasn't interested in it. And I passed it. Now, um, not too long, not too long, I was in a vision of the night. And I saw myself walking in a school setting, a campus setting. I went from class to class, I stood in front of the class, looked at the chairs, I went upstairs, I stood upstairs, I looked around. This was December 24th, 1997. This vision was given. December 24th, 1997. I walked around, I looked about, I looked around the campus, I looked around the chair, I said, wow, wow, wow. I didn't quite understand it. Then, much later, I saw myself in a matric gown. I was standing in the matric gown trying to take a photograph. The matric gown was lemon, um, lemon green. And from nowhere, two people joined me, a man and a woman. I didn't see their faces. And they took a picture with me and the vision lifted. When, uh, after this vision, about March 1998, uh, I started looking for admission. I had chosen a school. I had chosen, I think I had chosen about a polytechnic. I didn't get admission there. And so, um, polytechnic of Ilaro, I recognized that environment. By the time I got to the department that was forced upon me because the course I had wanted to read was ethnic management, I was given town regional planning. By the time I got to the department of town regional planning, oh my goodness, this was the class I had seen in the vision, exactly the way it was. As I moved upward, 
It was the studio I had seen in the vision. Wow! Very precise and accurate. And I knew that, you know what? This was God's will for me. Although the timing was short and it looked like I would not be admitted, I was admitted. Now, when it was time for matriculation, um, I didn't really have friends at that time. I was living uh, because, I mean, I was new on campus. I really didn't know people. But members of the First Square Church had been trying to evangelize me to join the fellowship. And at that time, I was living in their, you know, like their student hostel. So when it was time for my trip, I just took time, sneaked out of the house, went to the campus, borrowed somebody's matric gown, and I wore the matric gown. I just wanted to take a quick picture. I was looking to my right to take a quick picture, just so that there will be evidence at home that I, um, I matriculated in school. And while I stood there, all of a sudden, from nowhere, a man jumped out, a brother jumped out, a sister jumped out, and the brother said, oh, you're trying to sneak to take the picture without us. Both of them were in courtship at that time, their husband and wife now. My friends, Pastor Lumi there and Sister Fumi, you know, both of them joined me and took that picture with me. Immediately that picture was taken, I remember that vision again. Now, this was the Holy Spirit coming some almost a year before all those events to reveal to me his plan and purpose. Now, don't forget, he had told me early in 94, 95, that I was going to University of Lagos. But he did not reveal to me that I would go to a polytechnic and on my way to the university, I'll go to the polytechnic. In the polytechnic series, he will do certain work on the inside of me. And then I will go to the university. While I was in the polytechnic, I still kept on writing the university exam. Um, exam and I kept failing. I finished from the university. And guess what? Supernaturally, God opened the gate um, for, from the polytechnic. And supernaturally, God opened the gate. And I went to university. And it was a wonderful time in university. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Now, the Bible tells us by faith, God created all that we see. He created Eon. He created the endless ages. All right? So how did God create the endless ages? God simply said, let there be light. And in one word, God spoke time into existence. Spoke 1991, 1992, 1993, 1994, 1995. In that simple one word, every man that will exist within the context of this time was spoken into existence and their assignment was assigned, was given to them in the realm of the spirit. So that it was an, or there was already a program that is running as a software in the unseen realm, the software in the unseen realm for the advancement or the advancing of God's program on the face of the earth. Which simply means that your life cannot be an accident. And we see that in the life of Daniel, we see one of the most powerful demonstrations of an understanding of spiritual power. And how a man that has spiritual power is able to influence um, nations of the earth, is able to influence politics, is able to influence what people are doing and what people are, you know, and how the lives of people are doing. Tremendous, tremendous powerful man. In the, in the life of Daniel, we see um, a holy man, a godly man, having a daily work with God, and through spiritual understanding, moved in a dimension of the spirit and by law. And I want to give you a very quick uh, insight into some of the things the Word of God says, certainly not um, an all ex um, expository teaching, but just an insight. And I feel that this is important because going by the scriptures, if we allow scriptures to interpret the times we are living in, then we will understand that not only according to end-time prophecies are we living in dark times, all right? Uh, not only um, is the darkness going to deepen, and the sinister, sinister operations of many, many, um, in many, many quarters going to deepen, this time is supernaturally pregnant simultaneously with dangerous demonic activity, and a heightened divine activity within the kingdom of God. Every crisis on the face of the earth has seen the exaltation of certain men and a sudden um, window of opportunity for men who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Then we also need to get into the word of God and see from the perspective of the word how are we supposed to prepare ourselves 
from the perspective of God's word, how are we supposed to position ourselves? What are we supposed to do? How did um, events like this play out in the past? And I want to say to you that one of the accidents um, to the, the, before their generation, God had been preparing them behind the scene. And this is very essential for you and I to understand or for us to get. Okay? Now, let's take the case study of Daniel and the case study of Joseph. When things like this happen all over the world, when there's a major standstill like this that affects the apex um, government of the earth, like America, like Babylon, like Egypt, and the world seems to come into uh, a a season of transition where it looks like the earth is going to perish. Now let me say this to you, the earth is not perishing. The rapture is not about to happen tomorrow, although it is very, very close. Um, but nothing is going to remain the same after this pandemic is over. Nothing. Okay? You will see very unique scenarios where laws will come into place that will make it impossible for certain things that were before. However, Within all of these shenanigans, we are also going to see that allows them to stand within the political arena to make contributions that will get the sitting government and the constitution of the world to look in their direction. Understand? What Joseph had primarily that brought him to power was not first political authority. What Joseph had was spiritual authority. Okay? But on the account of the gift of interpretation of dreams and visions, we could call it interpretation of tongue because visions is a type of language, all right, and not everybody can interpret visions. I need you to get that. Joseph understood how the, the some other scientists somewhere are doing or what perspective, also using their tools to safeguard the moment and the world will see Jesus and hear Jesus like they've never heard it before. I often say to people, if Bill Gates comes into an encounter with a child of God, and this child of God moves in the gifts of the Spirit, and this leads to the salvation of Bill Gates, that singular encounter that Bill Gates has with that child of God is going to change the world. It will, we will see a new dimension to evangelism that does not exist right now. Now, but it would only be because that child of God is not just only able to move in the power of the Holy Spirit and is, has not just developed the gifts of the Spirit, but that child of God is also able to speak the language that Bill Gates understands and in the things that Bill Gates considers himself to be superior, that child of God simply dwarfs him by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, people can gain power in seasons like this. This is how gospel can gain power in seasons like this. All right? Okay, so we see Joseph. Joseph um, interprets the dream of Pharaoh. Not only did he interpret the dream of Pharaoh, Joseph is able to draw out, okay, Sir King, um, this is what you need to do to ensure that the famine does not eat up Egypt and um, to prepare Egypt for what is coming. And Pharaoh said, you know what? I can't find anybody in my realm that is as wise and as discerning. These were two words that Pharaoh used. And hundreds of years down the line, Nebuchadnezzar will use the same words for Daniel. Daniel will use the same words for himself. Daniel said, God, you have given me wisdom and might. And how did he come by the might that God gave to him? He didn't come by the might because he went to a military school. He simply came by the might because the gifts of God that was resting within his spirit, he was able to use this gift interpret, um, receive the visions from the Lord, interpret dreams and enigmas, and was able the people in Egypt were against Jews, you know. Um, Joseph was not, was not having any special advantage, okay. Joseph simply carried something that was just too superior to what existed. So, God took Joseph through that process in the house of Potiphar, took him to prison. In Potiphar's house, the qualifications of Joseph was his effectiveness in natural duties. 
The fact that Joseph could take do house chores, the fact that Joseph was faithful in natural things, you know, go and buy me food. Joseph went to buy food. Joseph did not have the security and the pampering of his father anymore. He was in a place where he had to grow up by force and respond positively with a right attitude in a contrary environment. Most Christians are not just going to make it. Most Christians are not suitable for the openings and the opportunities that God is creating in this season and in the seasons that will happen after this pandemic is over. Now, this is what I need you to understand, that the earth is not going to be the same as it used to be. Church is not going to be the same as it used to be. If what we think we will use to advance God's kingdom after this pandemic is over is our regular evangelism distributing tracts by the road. Now, those things will have their place. But if we are going to be, um, if we are going to be impact makers, if we are going to leave our imprint upon the sands of time and arrest the attentions of the nations of the earth or mighty organizations and institutions in the earth, we are going to arrest their attention. Then we must bring in something superior to the table. And I want to say that this superior thing we are bringing to the table, <laughs> we are talking about a very solid baptism of the Holy Spirit, where the gifts of the Spirit is burning on all twelve cylinders. The gift of prophecy, the interpretation of tongues. Now, not just interpreting tongues within the four walls of the church, <clears throat> interpreting the tongues of times, interpreting the tongues of nature, interpreting the tongues of catastrophe, as nature speaks in tongues to mankind, as weather changes, as the earth erupts, men are able to see the eruption of the earth and hear the language of the earth and capture the language of the earth the fire that is burning in Australia interpret, give interpretation to it and do economic policies that will save nations, men who have not heard the voice of God before and as they see and respond in the direction of our interpretation they begin to know that come there has to be something superior in this man how is he able to know these things have not gone to our university have not studied the soil, this was what Joseph had. But again, I want to say to you that the men who will stand in this position will not be accidental leaders. There will be men who have developed a work with God in their quiet place. They, at, the point, at the point when God was taking them through that process, it did not look like this was the process that would qualify them to stand in the center of God's plan and program when the crisis breaks open. All right? Now, you will find out that it wasn't any different for Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel was, a captivity, was, was in captivity in Babylon. And while he was in captivity in Babylon, they came to him, picked him up um, to register him among those two to be trained in civil service for, for Nebuchadnezzar. And, uh, but Daniel's conviction was cast in stone as a 17-year-old boy. You know, now, now you will see many, many compromises on multiple fronts as people begin to fear for their survival. That, oh, what is going to happen? And you see people, some people are going to be looting, some people are going to be stealing. There are Christians that are preparing to steal once they resume office because they don't know what will happen. After COVID-19, we don't know what COVID-20 is going to look like. If COVID-20 is going to be a tsunami that will cancel Africa out because it appears like the weakest of the continent. You will see many people who will be taking very ridiculous positions and thought processes. But here, I want to quickly share with you how God's people gain power and authority. And I'm not just talking about spiritual power. How spiritual power becomes the bedrock for political authority by which God's people are able to open doors that will further the cause of God on the face of the earth. Joseph could not have opened the gate of Egypt to his father and his brothers for the continuation of the covenant that God made to Abraham joining towards the fulfillment of the redemption of mankind. Joseph would not have been able to open that door if all Joseph had was spiritual power. He would not have been able to do that. Joseph had spiritual power, he had understanding, he was able to press into God, and when it was time for someone to give interpretation to the dream of Pharaoh, he gave the interpretation. Now, it was God that gave Pharaoh the dream. The dream God gave Pharaoh was a divine, was a divine global agenda. But that divine global agenda was just for one purpose. It was so that Jacob could leave the land of um, uh, Jacob could leave the land of Canaan. The brothers of um, Jared, um, uh, Joseph could leave the land of Canaan, and together all of them could come into Egypt because there was a prophecy that was lingering in the realm of the spirit that wanted to be fulfilled. That prophecy was hanging in the spirit. There was a covenant between God and a man called Abraham. That covenant must come to pass. 
Abraham was just the beginning of the outworking of a complex redemptive arithmetic. Jesus must come into the earth, mankind must be delivered from the bondage of sin and sickness and disease, the devil must be put permanently where he belongs when the, end, when the earth ends as we know it, alright? And so, for God to bring Jesus out, God is starting a plan with a man by the name of Abraham. For God to bring Jesus out, God will need to create some, some plan. Part of the plan that God had was a global shift that required political authority and superior wisdom from a man in whom dwelt the Spirit of God. That was part of God's plan. And so, we find Joseph coming in, and Joseph rises to power, after the Holy Spirit within him gave interpretation to the things that, you know, the dream, Joseph rises to power. On rising to power, what happens next? A time comes when Joseph's brothers show up. The Lord moved Joseph's brothers to Egypt. They had the news. They are hearing the news was not an accident. They had the news. When they had the news, they moved, they came down to Egypt, and Joseph was able to bring them in. When Joseph brought them in, the assignment on Joseph of Joseph's of God's life on Joseph was completed. Why God moved Joseph to Egypt was fulfilled. As far as Joseph is concerned, at the age of 37, Joseph had fulfilled his destiny because his destiny was to make sure that the, he became the gatekeeper that brought the people into the land of Egypt. Now, we will see that. But for Joseph to do that, Joseph needed political power. Joseph needed to be in the corridors of power where he could influence policies, where the king of the day could hear him. I am certain that across the length and breadth of the earth today, there are men within the kingdom of God that are, God is preparing for these kind of positions. You will find out that in days to come, the strongest and most powerful positions on earth will not be the pulpit. The most powerful positions on earth will be within the corridors of power within um, the earth where God will position men. Now, I am not disparaging the pulpit. A pulpit that is grounded in truth and in righteousness cannot be compared to anything. The church will remain the center of God's activity for the discipling of the saints, for the grooming of men for ministry, and for the releasing of men into ministry. The church will remain that. But there is an extension of the frontier of God's kingdom that is not going to happen within the four walls of the church. And this is how God's people, some of the people who have this peculiar destiny, are going to find themselves. That number one, there is a process, the process that God has taken you through before now, before this pandemic happened. Number two is that there is a constant fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit where there is no compromising of the values that God has placed on the inside of you. If you are compromising those values, if this is the calling you carry, you will never come to power. You need to understand that. Not all of us have been called to this place. When you look at the case of Daniel also, you will find out that Daniel maintained his righteousness until he got to that place. The men that will stand in this position of power will be men whose records will be investigated and nothing will be found against them. Because what they are bringing to the table. Let me share this with you. Earlier today, I, I think it was on um, BBC, I was looking at this on BBC, and a 17-year-old boy had developed a website that was tracking, that is tracking the death rates of the COVID-19 death rates across the world. A 17-year-old boy, all right? And this website is trending. The world is turning to the website. As a matter of fact, it almost looks like that website is the only website on earth today. The website is titled, um, um, uh, the, I think the website is COVID19.life. So as people are dying in different countries are, 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 all over the world, the website is updating it to give um, the update of the new figures. As people are dying, that website is updating it. Now, that is a 17-year-old boy. That boy designed that website. Right now, companies are reaching out to that boy from all over the world, asking the boy to allow them to put adverts on, on his website because that website has shot forward. That is a boy that at the age of 17 is able to design what the need of the moment is and has gone in to create a website that suddenly, yesterday nobody knew him, today a company in America is, was trying to pay him 8 million US dollars so that they can put an advert on that website, 8 million US dollars. You don't, you, if, even if you went to school, got a PhD, you are not likely going to just have 8 million dollars in a month or in a day or in a year. 
But for something that is divinely gifted to do, he created a website without thinking of any financial uh, remuneration or any returns. That website has gone ballistic and then a company called him and said, we will pay you $8 million, 17 years old. $8 million, just let's put an advert on your website. And guess what? The 17-year-old boy declined. Now, I'm saying to you that if you and I are going to make the most of this, this is the time when certain people with very unique assignments are going to come to the fore. All right? If God is calling you, if God has, if you have ever received a vision or a dream that says to you that God will have, will have you walk in certain places, I want you to know this is the time to wait on the Lord. This is the time to pray. This is the time to be spirit-filled. I also want to encourage that we will look beyond just going around the corners. It is time for believers to begin to cultivate their gifts and their talent and cultivate skills. Skills that are skill sets that is the language of the time. Pastors also, get in tune, get informed, get, get acquaint yourself with the goings on around the world and take this goings on into the place of prayer and let's ask, how do we play as church? How do we function as church in this time, in this season? What does God want us to do? Let me say this to you, a church, a believer, a Christian can shoot to the fore line in an instant by just receiving an idea from the Lord, an idea that is accurate, an idea that is correct, an idea that is well implemented. A child of God can shoot forward just like that in an instant. Okay?